everybody and, and the other engineers may or may not appreciate it, but you know, that effort's just done seamlessly in our office, you know, uh, automatically in our office. Um, then the next uh, uh, part would be the installation verification where they're, you know, going to, at the end of the installation, go back through and, and um, you know, do a more thorough inspection and verification of the installation. Uh, some contractors, um, I'm sorry, some mechanical engineers require that the DDC system um, not be hidden in any way. So um, while a lot of DDC controls contractors, us included, will put controllers up in above drop ceilings right on the piece of equipment that we're controlling. Um, you know, say it's a small air handler serving a room like this, we'll, we'll put the device right on the air handler. There's some engineers that, won't, that will say, no, that's not acceptable. I want the piece of, uh, you know, the system component to be located in a mechanical room, um, protected, and, and, and uh, you know, where somebody can service it. So it means a lot more wire. But that, that installation verification and commission is going to make sure that our installation not only meets code, but it meets the requirements of that project. Um, and that's our job to know which engineer requires what and, and do it accordingly. Um, then they, they'll go in, into the DDC verification. Um, finally, to a functional performance test, which kind of is the DDC. And the functional performance test is, you know, when, when, when uh, typically they'll, they'll say, when I turn uh, the S3 return fan speed to 50%, uh, does the VFD actually go to 50%? So they're just going to do a point-to-point -point checkout. Um, and then they'll, they'll ch check the sequences uh, along with that functional performance test. And uh, finally, they verify commissioning of our training. Um, they want to make sure that we've trained the owner and, and the owner satisfied with that training process and how it's all, all final, been finalized. And, and if we've done our job right, well, it's just a signature on the commissioning report. We have a copy of it, and that goes in our file forevermore. And uh, it's a baseline. What I look at that, whether the, we've had it commissioned by a commissioning agent or we've self-commissioned, um, that's our baseline, our starting point. Of, of, of the building automation system. So we're going to take it from there and, and uh, enhance it and uh, make sure it uh, operates correctly for the building. Is it? Am I? We've got 15 minutes left to class. Oh, that's it? It's so much for a break. 30, 11, wow. Is that clock right or am I? I don't know. Pretty close. Yeah, it's pretty close. 11, off. Sorry. Um, you got me started. I couldn't stop. I get so excited. Sorry well, about that. You haven't seen anybody here complaining. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because see, a lot of what we're, you know, what we do is when we go into buildings and we want to make adjustments, like, you know, one of the things we always look at is, like, you know, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, if you've got four air handlers and they all start at the same time. Oh, yeah. You know, and you have yep. commercial units. Yep. So your program can stagger that. Oh, we, we, you know, there. Uh, you, you, a, a management program and a, an energy management Mm -hmm. can do a lot of our work for, you know, things for us to help people save. Absolutely. Especially, like you said, you know, like, yeah, you know, the teacher comes in twice, your car machine comes in, yep. the room, then comes up to have six. If, you know, if you set it on normal stuff, when it's, you know, classes at seven, so it starts ramping up at 645, you know, well, what if there's not class in that room that day? Exactly. Or if she moves her class to another location. This way, you know, it's, and they're just good suggestions for us to know, you know, to know the capacity of the building to the system, mm -hmm. so we can make recommendations. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's, um, I, I don't even, I can't remember seeing a sequence that, uh, you know, calls for staggered start times, you know, on, on, uh, on equipment. Well, I'm sure there, there have, I haven't seen one recently, I'll put it that way. Um, it, it's something we do automatically. We just didn't, you know, we just understand that, you know, we don't want to bang somebody's demand meter um, mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. cause them to, you know, have a, electric bill that, you know, is staggering. So we just do, do you know, things like that automatically. It's kind of an unwritten, you know, um, requirement of a building, good build, building automation okay, contractor. Just the point, like even with lighting, you know, a lot of places, you know, you know all the low voltage lights, you may just kick on at 6 o'clock, you know. Well, do you really need to turn on all the lights at 6 o'clock? Yep. No. You know. I wanted to show you... Um, you know, going down, this is, this is one controller. These are, uh, I showed you the outputs, uh, scrolling down through this program. This is all just data that's sucked out of one of our controllers that we've set up on a job. Um, you know, we'll have inputs, um, you know, VFD bypass status, static pressure, discharge air temp, um, return air temp, pump statuses, chill water, 
temperatures, yada, yada. So basically we take all the inputs, you know, run it through set points and, and programming and, and then manipulate the outputs. So you've seen the inputs and the outputs. We'll scroll down and, and these are uh, what we call variables. These are kind of like set points and or programming points that, um, you know, we can manipulate either from a front end uh, or in software. Um, and this is just, again, one controller. And there's a lot of different things here. Morning warm-ups. Um, that's a sequence that constantly changes and gets better and better as time goes on. Um, you know, we'll be looking at discharge air, low alarms, high alarms. All these set points are adjustable by the user. Um, we'll scroll down through. And we've got 130 points of, of information that we're, we're manipulating inside the software program. Um, these are just controllers, the PID loops. Weekly schedules. This one controller has uh, actually four, four schedules. Annual schedules. Uh, we may have, you know, uh, some customers will decide that no matter what, to save energy, air conditioning does not turn on before April 15th. And we actually have customers that say that. So we'll develop an, you know, a uh, annual schedule that, that walks out the air conditioning until April 15th, from October 15th to April 15th regardless of how warm it is in the building. That's the, um, and then these are the programs, uh, the, 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 the titles of the programs. Um, I just wanted to show you what a program looks like inside one of our controllers. And we may be a little unique. Um, you know, this is kind of product specific. But no matter what method is used or what brand of uh, products are used, you're going to have programming in the controllers. Um, it may look like this or it may look like entirely foreign with block programming and functions, um, but it's, it's going to do the same thing. So this program one is just a, a, a program, and if, if you've done any basic programming, it's, this is just basic, you know, uh, kind of a basic tool, Con, uh, visual basic almost. Um, you know, it's if and then logic statements. And with that, you can, you, can, you know, your, the only limitation is your imagination on how things will operate. You can do everything. So all of this is programming to operate one air handler and one chiller um, in a very, very complicated sequence. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at some here. <laughs> yeah. You know, we have, I mean, just it's complicated. Um, but we can do energy calculations, you know, just math functions. You know, it's very easy to do in, in, with our product tools our programming tools, um, you know, and all, again, we're still, we're just going through just programming fields of one controller, albeit a good size controller. This one's, you know, a pretty good size air handler, but um, all the way down through the, uh, and this would, this program is probably consistent with the, uh, the, the rooftop unit I showed you for Longview, the, the one that was on the screen. This would be consistent with a, a piece of equipment that size and that complex. So, and that's that. Now, um, you asked about energy um, calculations. Uh, let's see. This is a... Um, a project that we've uh, we did that um, I think this is a gentleman's home. He'll he'll remain nameless so he doesn't know where uh, we're flaunting his uh, his house. We won't see any of his family in here. Promise. Um, here's what I wanted to show you: is we have the um, energy <coughs> calculations being done here. Um, we did these calculations based on um, known facts. Some of it's done with, um, uh, with actual, uh, you know, current devices where we're measuring current, but most of, some of this is, most of it's done by assumptions based on a one-time, you know, uh, reading of the equipment. So basically, we, what we've determined here, whoops, it's going to update every couple minutes here. And here is the total KW, uh, kilowatt hours used. Um, Cost per KW, he's, he's at 11 cents. Um, so right now, since, since the last uh, reset, and I, I'm not sure what the, the time, time frame is, but the geothermal system has cost him $1,987.
based on his current electric rate. Um, the equivalent cost for LP uh, would have been $4,700 at the uh, current cost per, per therm or per gallon. Uh, at $229 a gallon, his cost would have been $4,748. $4,747. Yep. Now, I think, I think we can go in here and, 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 and adjust that, uh, um, I think we can adjust that uh, cost per gallon on LP. What's, what's the current cost on LP? Does anybody know? Well, let's just try to, uh, we'll just, I heard 328, so we'll, we'll throw in 328 and uh, we'll see, make sure he's uh, still allowing us to adjust his system here. Propane? Yep. $3.16 uh, a gallon is what they're listing here for credit. Well, well, we can make it change. <laughs> we have the power. We have way, see, this, this is what he that's wants to keep other people from doing. Oh, we well, can that's make why it. I was saying, we can, you can make someone really okay. nuts on April Fool's I can force Stephen that down if I go right into this portion of the program. So have you ever had a, or heard of a sis, situation where the security printers failed and somebody's screwing with the building? Not yet. For whatever reason? Not yet. Nope. Um, your, IT could, your IT department could get involved with it too. I know, I know ours has. And yep. They actually doing corruption and everything else when they don't right. have any kind of issue. We're, uh, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to, um, wanted to review today was the, the uh, you know, the, the, the building technologies are really, you know, uh, changing and, and uh, our, our whole industry is constantly in a ch state of change. But uh, one of the things that makes it challenging for us is the fact that, you know, we have to work, um, wor work with uh, electricians, with HVAC professionals, with engineers, with architects, um, with contractors of all types, um, build owners and users, um, and, 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 and understand enough of about all of their their worlds mm -hmm. to be yeah and then the the one the, you know the one i left out at the end is the uh is the it industry mm -hmm. um the this system here didn't get on the the internet um you know easily uh and most of our systems don't don't happen easily we have to we have to you know jump out of our sandbox our building automation sandbox and jump into the it uh, IT guys sandbox and, and as you probably you know know they sometimes those folks don't like to play nicely um, they that's their system it's their firewall and anybody that wants to poke a hole through it is is you know they're, they're treading on on darn thin ice they don't want to they don't want any security risks and um, they want to make sure that they have control over everything that comes and goes through their networks so it's it's a challenge and sometimes the challenge is uh, you know just just too much, you know, they, they're, their security is too great. They don't want anything like this published over the internet. They, they don't want people to get access no matter what. Um, we work with government facilities that we're able to penetrate into without a problem. Um, they, they control the access and, they, you know, they're, they're pretty good about what they do. Um, we have, um, you know, big insurance companies that we can get right into, no problems. In, in uh, hospitals, medical facilities, no problems. But yet we'll have a school that um, you know, for whatever reason, their, their information is, you know, paramount and they're not going to let anybody in. So it, it becomes what, the only way we can work with that is to become knowledgeable to actually understand their world enough so that we can, um, you know, talk intelligently and, and, and prove to them and show them that we're not a threat and that our system is not going to present a risk um, or whatever risks that our system would present. Here's how you... Here you work with them, work with the, the risks. So, so what we've had to do is we've had to educate ourselves um, with how our systems integrate to, um, to networks and networking. 
um, which is, it's fun, it's a, it's a, but it's another, it's another hat you have to change and in, in, in work with in the building automation business. So when, if we go to hire, one of the things I wanted to, to uh, review in the short class, uh, which I can't believe the time went by that fast, um, you know, is, is what we look for, you know, in an employee. Um, if we're, if we're, you know, going to hire someone. Wes asked me to, you know, to kind of, kind of touch on that and, and uh, it's a good thing to touch on. Uh, our perfect employee would be a master electrician um, with a, a Microsoft networking degree and certification by Microsoft, um, as well as, you know, at least 20 years HVAC um, mechanical service and installation experience. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, maybe be a computer programmer too. And, and, and a PE. These people are a dime a dozen, right? Yeah, yeah, they're usually unique, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. no I yeah. went to a job interview once and a guy told me he wanted, what do you want? He wanted five years uh, welding, 10 years pneumatic, six years hydraulic, 12 years mechanical, and then 10 years electrical. And he was willing to pay me $15 an hour. Wow. I closed the briefcase and walked out. Wow. That's like, Wow. Well, well, we're beating you know employees like I just described off with a stick. They're they're lined up everywhere. <laughs> so that that uh, we just adjusted the gas uh, gas price and of course you know now his savings um, uh, his savings have come out to be forty eight hundred dollars, and uh, you know the equivalent cost would have been sixty eight hundred dollars. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, Um, this is the time on. It's the, the, this is the time on that the pellet stove has been running. This is a little unique. I, I, I'd like to tell you about this. Uh, this customer, um, he 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 wanted to install a geothermal system, and this is a small house. This is uh, you know it's a thirty. Uh, I'm just going to guess maybe a thirty-two hundred square foot you know residence. Um, a real nice nice man that owns it. Um, uh, he may be a little smaller. I'm just guessing. It's a it's a fairly nice house that he and his wife built back in the you know probably in the 70s or early 80s. Um, you know, typical three to four bedrooms. Nothing. You know, it's a nice house, but not not uh, you know not uh, a trophy home. Not one of the mansions that you know we sometimes get invited in to look at. Um, we did a geothermal project. He added geothermal heat pumps and an artesian well, and we did all the controls associated with those. Um, he also kept kept his uh, propane or uh, LP furnaces and you know operated all that. He's got a solar panel on the roof, and he had a pellet stove in his in his uh, living room, a great room. And uh, when we 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 gave him a price just to do the building automation system for the geothermal and the conventional heat, um, and he asked if we could could you could you take over control of my my pellet stove. And I looked at it and I said, "Ooh, I don't know. I wonder." And and uh, I looked at it and I said, "Boy, I have the same pellet stove at home. It happened to be a Harman P68 um, pellet stove. I don't know if you're fam anybody's familiar with that, but it's a it's a nice pellet stove. Just a forced hot air, you know, living room pellet stove, 68,000 BTU. Um, it's got an automatic feeder, an automatic ignition system. So it's uh, basically you fill it with pellets and and turn it on, set the s set point, and it's done. Yep, exactly. That's it. And I, I love mine. I, I Yeah, I, 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 based on my experience, Harman P68 is a great one. Um, well, he wanted to control, wanted us to control it, start and stop this automatic ignition cycle on the pellet stove. So I figured, well, let's let's give it a shot and see what we can do. So I looked at it, and and um, I didn't see any external terminals on the circuit board. So I said, well, it's time to call Harman, find out what they'll offer us. So we contacted the factory. I actually was able to finally get through to an engineer, and they said, oh, absolutely not. You cannot touch the electronics on, on this. This is a factory, you know, a mod, a factory um, configured CAN program that you can't get into the software and you can't get into the circuitry on this board. I said, okay, thank you. And then um, I went back, brought that information back to the owner. And they also added that if we did anything, it would void warranty, of course. Um, so I brought that information back to the owner and he said, well, it's not under warranty anyway. I don't care. Figure out something. <laughs> so, I like this guy. Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. So we, uh, I, I said, well, I, you know, I pulled his board apart and I looked at it and, I mean, I'm not an electronics major or anything, but I said, geez, I'm going to have a hard time figuring this one out. So I didn't want to wreck his, so I put it back together and I went home and pulled mine apart. And uh, <laughs> 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 So 
No, she came home and said, what are you doing? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, and I, I played with it and, and I found out, you know, I found a way to, to integrate to it. Uh, you and uh, mine's out of, well, You're not I didn't, I didn't, I didn't explode anything. I didn't, I didn't let the smoke out. We understand that all electronic components operate on smoke. So if you let the smoke out, they won't work anymore. Exactly. My smoke is still in on mine, so it still works. Um, but I just found a simple way to integrate to it. Uh, mine has a remote sensor, and, and you know, I, I basically took one of our circuit boards and our controls, and I, I, I simulated what their remote sensor is doing, and I offered up that bit of information in an integration format to the pellet stove through software. I can control the pellet stove. So it works flawlessly. Um, so, you know, and, and, and we did it, and uh, he's happy with it. I still haven't done it. I don't have a building automation system at my house, even though I kind of pulled it apart and checked everything out. But, children. yep. Um, but this, this project has been working for, uh, I think we're, this is our second, second mm -hmm. winter. Yeah, second winter with the pellet silver under control, and, and it, it operates great. Um, he actually has, we, we um, oh, I wanted to show you a few of our control components, but we have, um, we have one of our, um, our, our goodie bag. We have one of these uh, sensors, our room thermostats, in, his, uh, in, the, in one of the rooms. And, and basically, you know, it's just temperature set point up and down. Um, we programmed these buttons under the cover to do different things in his house uh, for a basic low cost, um, you know, control system interface into the, you know, in addition to the web enabled system. But um, so we controlled one of these buttons to, to be a pellet stove enabled. So if he wants to turn his pellet stove on, he just, uh, and override the set temperature set point, he just hits a button and that, tells the pellet stove to light and run for four hours so he and his wife can, you know, enjoy the fire by the pellet stove. And um, the, uh, one of the other items that we typically, I'm not going to pull it all out of there, I'll let you, uh, huge sequence now is demand ventilation. Um, we did it down at uh, the tech down in Nashua. This is a uh, space carbon, di uh, carbon, mono uh, yeah, carbon dioxide uh, transmitter. This is measuring the carbon dioxide in a, in a space, and we can take that information and sequence the system do it, to do whatever we want. So if you go into the tech down in Nashua, um, a lot of the rooms, we have those, uh, those type of sensors in, either in the room or in the return duct. Uh, that one happens to be a duct-mounted one. The room ones, we usually have a display on them. Um, it's just a standard actuator. Those actu these, these, these actuators would control uh, dampers, valves, um, anything you want to operate would have an actuator on it to, to be able to, you know, translate a signal from a DDC system. Uh, typical hot water valve that would be under control. What's that? John, John, I didn't realize Johnson made one of those. Uh, they, they, ha they bought out a little mom and pop out. And then they have, all, they have their own now. They just call them ribs. Well, um, <laughs> interestingly enough, we, uh, yeah, uh, well, rib, rib is, I think, um, if I'm not, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Functional Devices is the company that actually, they actually their, their relays are named ribs. Um, they could be owned by Johnson for all I know. Yeah, they were, they were small, a small company. Oh, no kidding. Um, interestingly enough, this is uh, one of our a typical uh, controller. Now, they're going to call this an advanced application controller um, as opposed to what some people would call it an application-specific controller. Application-specific would be something like that where it's kind of designed and, and manufactured to be a VAV controller. Um, this is just a generic. You could use this on pretty much anything. Um, it looks like what's on my furnace. Oh, really? Wow. Um, the wireless aspect of what, what's going on in the in industry, I mean, wireless is definitely a, a good technology that's advancing quickly. Um, we haven't, it, it, it doesn't make real good sense for us to use wireless as, as much in our, in our world yet. Uh, the cost is typically higher than what we could do to wire up a sensor. Where we would use wireless is if we can't get a wire from point A to point B. Um, we've done some museum work. Um, 
And in museums, sometimes, you know, an existing facility, if we couldn't get a wire, or, you know, to a thermostat, and we don't want to be trying to drill granite walls or something like that, we would use wireless in that application. Um, you had mentioned the uh, uh, rib. This, this would be a rib in our world. Ah, cool. And, and that actually just snaps into the controller. It snaps right in, and you yep. just bring in your signal wires. So, yeah, we just t terminate the wires to the, to the control. Yep. And uh, interestingly enough is that that rib, uh, in essence, has a handoff auto switch on it, too. Right. So we pop this cover off and just snap those in. You just have uh, slots right yep. there? Yep. Yep. Pull the jumper out and snap that right in. And, and uh, now, uh, when, you know, you go into the fail-safe mode, we've got a device that operates under control, under program, and then... Uh, if the control system fails, if that controller failed, you could just switch it into the hand mode and, and kind of manipulate right. each output in hand mode. Um, we also have these, these are called um, handoff auto cards, HPO cards. We actually have those, um, those cards available in analog output as well. So you could switch a, a, an output into, into hand and, and, and dial it in. If it was an outside air damper or a hot water valve, if you didn't want it to be full open, you could actually dial it in a percentage open. So the rib is right there in the control. I don't have to go out to the yep. location. And, you know, the, the, uh, not every controls manufacturer has that particular equipment or, or it's something that looks exactly like that, but most every controls manufacturer is going to have something extremely similar to that. So they, they you know, they'll have, uh, you know, uh, their, Johnson will have Johnson's version of that device. And Honeywell will have their versions of it. So um, there's a lot of similarities. From one manufacturer to another. Which uh, which one? The VAV? Yeah. Um, this one here? Yeah, no, I was looking at the clocking position. Looks like what do you have a plate that you mount onto the side of the unit and then just set that on? No, well, this will go right onto the shaft, and then there's a, uh, a little clip that locks it in place so it won't rotate. Okay, that's what I was looking yep. at. Yeah, we have a little, I, I didn't bring one with me, but it's just a little, little clip, uh, one screw holds it right in place. So. And some goodies, huh? Did everything make it back? Um, the, uh, the, the, the most product lines, most of the manufacturer's product lines will have, you know, a lot of different controllers and a lot of different, um, you know, devices going along with it. I just grabbed a few basic things that you'd run into out in the field and, you know, I mean, you've probably seen them all, installed most of them. Yeah, but yours are pretty, yeah, I was, I was laughing about is, yeah, yours are aesthetically pleasing. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, a VA, a VA, a VA, like, you know, like that. It's a gray, a lot of them look like these big old gray black metal, you know, pot metal. Or yep. <laughs> yep. Like, you think mechanical arm, I think, what the heck? The, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, the, uh, let's get this out of here. I definitely do like the way you have the ribs right there. The, um, that's fine right there. The, the, uh, the, the, the Johnson controls, I mean, and, you know, I, I, I service a lot of different, you know, as a company we service different brands and, and, and I think almost every manufacturer has got advantages and disadvantages, you know, um, and, and a lot of times it boils down to, you know, tastes great, less filling type of an approach. Um, what we've found is, is it's more, and, and I think a lot of our uh, peers would probably tend to agree, it's more the control contractor that makes the product work, you know. I mean, I think that KMC controllers have, uh, you know, a lot of features that are, uh, you know, uh, that are, you know, advantageous over the, the competitions, but the reality is Johnson may be able to install a job, you know, less expensive or, or you know, better than I did if they had a better person installing it and, and programming it. So um, it, I think it, in, in, at the end of the day, it boils down to the company that's, you know, uh, producing the submittals and, and doing the installation and doing the programming and the commissioning and servicing the facility. Uh, ultimately, you know, next door is a good example. You know, if you're, if you're coming up with uh, some ideas that, geez, this building doesn't seem like it's working properly, well, something, something didn't happen right, you know, to, to, to get you into that situation. And, th and that's actually occurred on some of our projects in the past, you know, where a customer, you know, didn't call us and we forgot to call them to check on some stuff because they didn't want to buy the initial service contract. Um, then we've, you know, uh, 
I don't want to say forgotten about them, but we've you know gotten busy on some other projects, and, and uh, next thing we know, we'll get a you know phone call that uh, the system is is terrible and it's never worked right, and you know it's wasting energy, and we'll go in and you know make a few adjustments and tune up a few um, sensors and have it back to normal, hopefully. So. With Johnson, you, know, you have to go out physically to the device, mount, you know, mount the rib, wire it in, yep. put the controller there, and everything. And then you still have to, the program will set the points for it. Yep. Here you just plug it in and set the points. Well, we, uh, you know, we still use... Um, you still have to have the wiring out to the unit. But, uh, yeah, and we, st we still use relays out at the device. And you, and, you know, you have to yeah. I mean, if we're switching 120, like if we're starting in an exhaust fan, right. you know, I wouldn't, I can. Technically, I can switch 120 through our controller, but... Yeah. I prefer not to, you know. Just it it creates a uh, you know safety risk on our, our technicians. We just don't do it that way. Yeah, sure. Yep. Yep. Um, oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. We 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 <laughs> we get we get that all the time. Um, one of the other things too is uh, uh, the 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 uh, oh. Um, I, I can I can uh, quit whenever you guys want the uh, the integrations. Uh, I just want to mention that 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 building over there is a backnet. The controllers I've seen enough of the building to understand that or know that that building is a backnet compliant building. The controllers are backnet certified. So what that means is uh, when we do the controls in this building, um, we're gonna you know automatically make this a backnet building because then the end user has the opportunity to integrate the two systems into one. So at the end of the day, um, like we were showing you the going to the VAV boxes on the long view project and then looking at the rooftop, um, that rooftop has a Johnson controls, I believe it's Johnson in New York rooftop, uh, back net compliant controller and the rest of the building is all KMC controls. So we've integrated the two. So at the front end, at the, at the, at the business end of the control system that the operator is going to use, doesn't, make any difference. doesn't matter. It, and it won't matter to him at all. Um, and so that's hardware can be integrated on different types. Yes. That was one of the questions there. Yep. Could I just interrupt for one sure. second? Sure. You, you're welcome to stay, and some of these people may want to stay and ask you questions for a while, but I suspect other people may have to get yep. going. So I just want to make a couple of quick announcements. Number one, I am still working on the Wiesman trip. I'm still working on having the... Uh, the fellow from Van Zelm Engineering come up for a, remember we talked at the beginning of the class that it'd be an evening talk in, in place of a day class. I don't have those down because the people haven't gotten back to me, but I'm hoping to, I will fit, I'm going to try and fit one more time with Keith in, that's three out of our five classes. Our last class is, um, is going to be the presentation, which will leave the equivalent of one class plus any time you want to spend for getting the other building and your project working on them. So that's the agenda basically for the rest of that, the rest of the class, how it actually plays out. Uh, please stay tuned and I'm sorry I can't be more specific, but I'm, I'm dealing with, it's like herding cats. Okay, so um, I got an email this morning from Jim Vanderhoeven, who's the vice president of the college saying that there are a bunch of scholarships that are out there that you can apply for. That's the good news. And right now, there aren't very many applicants, like the NASA scholarship last semester. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that they've got to be in, the applications have to be in on the fourth, today being the first. But if you're in need of money, to continue or are made of money and perhaps want some support even if you could continue, I highly urge you to go down to financial aid before you leave today and get an application and fill it out. I don't think many of them are as complex as what you would have had to do what some of you did last semester for the NASA. I really encourage you, don't let this money go begging. Please go and be proactive for yourself because the money is there and you deserve it. Okay, so uh, anything I can do to help you know where to find me um, as far as that goes. And one more announcement, which is, who went, was it you, Leona? Did you go to the USDA workshop 
I just got an email from, this is going around for the energy committees, that they've announced the grants. Uh, it looks like New Hampshire might get as much as $1.8 million. They're for businesses in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And if you have any, if I'll put this up or I'll, I'll send out a copy yeah, of it to you all. Um, so you have the details, but if you can think of any projects, um, go for it. You know, either for, you know, like if you're working with a business or you have another idea, go for it. And, excuse me, if there's any way we can be supportive, please let me know. What I found is that it's pretty high end work that they're looking at. It has to be financed by the corporation owner, or whatever, and it's really a need to do. Mm -hmm. We give the money after the after it's done, and the 